So welcome along ladies and gentlemen to your weekly SETI seminar series. Uh, today we're very fortunate to be joined by uh, Gary Glatzmeyer who's come across uh, the mountains uh, from UC Santa Cruz. Uh, Gary got his uh, PhD at UC Boulder, uh, but he's a man after my own heart. He uh, uh, served in the Navy before getting his PhD and uh, uh, served as a uh, instructor for nuclear physics for uh, the U.S. Navy for four years. Uh, after that, he also he went to uh, the U.K. and uh, studied at Newcastle upon Tyne and uh, Cambridge. Uh, and uh, Gary's work relates to uh, the structure and dynamics of the <coughs> interiors of stars and planets. Uh, he is particularly uh, published in uh, looking at giant planets and uh, their satellites. Stellar bodies, and uh, he uses uh, nonlinear differential equations, uh, solution uh, derived by uh, computer programs that he designs, uh, and to put them together into 3D models and to uh, interpret what's going on internally in uh, the structure uh, of uh, condensed bodies. So uh, today he's going to talk to us about uh, about that work, and particularly. Uh, looking at the geodynamo, uh, that's important for us to learn. So if you'll join me in welcoming Gary. Thank you, Adrian. I assume you can hear me okay? Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about some of the research I've been doing for quite a few years now. Uh, as Adrian was saying, I'm, I'm interested in how in the fluid dynamics, the internal fluid dynamics, uh, in, in planets and stars, and how that fluid dynamics generates magnetic fields, uh, how uh, the rotation of the body affects all of this. So what I'm going to do is talk about, uh, if I have time, three different areas. I'll start with giant gas planets, simulations I've done with trying to understand the fluid dynamics and magnetic field generated in the interior of gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn. And then I'll switch over to a terrestrial planet like the Earth and show you some simulations of geodynamo, in other words, the, the, me the mechanism for generating magnetic field in the Earth. And then hopefully I'll have time to talk a little bit about a project that uh, Francis Nimmo and I are working on. Well, we're co-advising our graduate student who is working on uh, trying to simulate the uh, ocean circulation in the subsurface oceans of, uh, for example, of, of Europa, and how that circulation generates magnetic field. So um, that's the plan. I'm going to begin by just showing you a movie, a, a very short movie of snapshots taken by one of the Voyager spacecraft many years ago as it approached Saturn. And uh, what you'll see is is um, each snapshot in the movie is taken about 10 hours apart so that it's going to appear as if you, the viewer, is in the rotating frame of, of this planet. So uh, basically, on average, it'll take 10 hours for the planet to go around, take a snapshot. And so what you'll see are various cloud features that are moving relative to the mean rotation rate of the surface. And you'll see in the epicurial region that these clouds are moving very rapidly eastward. And in other places, other latitudes, they'll be moving westward and, and, and back and forth. So this is just to prepare you for what I'm going to be talking about in a minute. But it's interesting to actually see it in reality. So see small cloud features, some moving to the left, some moving to the right, and very fast, I'll learn that again, and very fast in the equatorial region. So this is called differential rotation. This is true on the giant planets and on stars like the sun. In other words, since the uh, material here is, is a fluid, 
expands from the outside and it changes to a liquid in the interior, it doesn't need to rotate as a solid body. And so there are forces that cause the rotation rate to be different at different latitudes and also at different depths. This is one way to illustrate what it looks like at the surface. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at here a plot for Jupiter, Saturn, and, and Uranus. Uh, the equator, in all cases, is here, the geographic North Pole and South Pole. And these, this is a measure in terms of meters per second of what the, the average longitudinal velocity is at the surface. And um, as what, what we just saw was, was Saturn showing a very large um, eastward flow in the equatorial region, and then westward, eastward, westward, eastward, basically relative to some mean value. Um, so the salt line is what Voyager took. This, these data points are more recent. They've uh, been taken by the, by the Hubble spacecraft, or space, space telescope, and uh, showing that in the meantime, over quite a few, a couple decades now, that the peak rotation rate in the equatorial region of Saturn, at least what's observed by the clouds, uh, has decreased, although the, the banded structure at higher latitudes is still there. This is what you see on Saturn, or on, on Jupiter, the amplitude is a little bit less than it is on, on uh, Saturn, but you have many more bands. On Uranus, and also in Neptune, it's the reverse. In the equatorial region, you have a westward flow, and uh, and, and not a large number of bands. So this, this one's actually closer to what the Earth does. At, in the equatorial region of, for the Earth, the winds flow from east to west. So these are they're called easterlies because they come from the west, or from the east. Um, and at high latitudes or mid latitudes where we are, the predominant flow, the jet streams, is to the east. So this is, this is similar to what the Earth and Uranus and Jupiter have this, what's called a retrograde rotation in the equatorial region, opposed to the prograde rotation rates you see on, on Jupiter and Saturn. So one of the questions is why? Why are these all different? Why are there bands? What maintains this? How deep does this pattern um, exist below the surface? Uh, in each of these, which way is the rotation? Oh yeah, the rotation rate is always going to be, in other words, it'll be positive. So if you're looking in the inertial frame, uh, what, what this is, basically what this is saying is that for Saturn, the equatorial region is rotating more rapidly than other, everything's rotating eastward, if you're in, looking at it from the inertial frame. And it's just that the equatorial region is rotating more rapidly than, than other latitudes. So, various ways of modeling this, um, there, there are a large number of models out there, and they, they approach it different ways. Uh, there are atmospheric type models, and there are 3D global uh, convection models, which is what I'll talk about today. There are these two different communities that have evolved over the years. There's a, there's a group from the atmospheric, the Earth's atmospheric climate modeling, that has started to uh, model or change the models and make them look like other planets like Jupiter. Uh, the, the disadvantage of those models is they, they tend to use, use what's called a shallow water approximation, which is good for the Earth because the Earth's atmosphere is so shallow compared to the radius of the Earth. Uh, and so you can simplify the equations, simplify the computer models by making certain approximations. Uh, unfortunately, those Approximations aren't good for giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn that have very, very deep um, uh, fluid bodies. In fact, some giant planets may have no solid core at all. So there are disadvantages. Uh, the problem they get is most of these simulations that use atmospheric type models get the retrograde flow, get, get at the equator the fluid flowing is, is flowing uh, in the westward direction instead of the eastward direction. There is another choice where uh, of some of the 3D models, that many of the 3D models have been published, use what's called a Boussinesque approximation, 
where they assume the background density is constant. Uh, the reason they're doing this is because many of these models came from the geodynamo community where the fluid in the liquid core of the Earth is fairly constant. It doesn't vary very much from the bottom of the core to the top of the core. And so in those models, many of the models assume that the background density is constant. And so then if you take that model and, and go to Jupiter, again, that's not a good approximation because in Jupiter, the density varies by a large amount, especially in the, in the, in the surface area, in surface layers. Like a star, it's, it's, the density goes from very small in surface and, and increases very, very quickly with depth. So the alternative way is to use what's called the inelastic approximation, which accounts for the, this large variation in density, the density stratification. And then, of those models, some uh, assume no magnetic field and are just interested in what maintains the differential rotation, for example, the fluid flows. Uh, and then there are models that also include the magnetic equations and simultaneously solve for the magnetic field that's generated. So there's all these different, uh, different ways of defining what a computer model is for, for gas giants. What I'm going to do now is just very, very briefly go through the equations that I solved and many other people solved. Uh, I won't give you symbols or anything, but just, just give you a flavor of what, what goes into a model like this. You have you basically, you basically uh, start with the conservation laws of physics, conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. So conservation of mass means that uh, Mass can flow from one place to another, but, but we're never going to create or destroy mass. We're not going to account for nuclear reactions, for example. So uh, you have to write in mathematical terms uh, how this mass conservation is always constrained in the model. Uh, conservation of magnetic flux, another way, a way of saying that is that there are no magnetic monopoles. So you have magnetic flux. There's no, there's no magnetic field lines don't all stop at a given point, like the like electric field lines do. So you have conservation of magnetic flux, one of, uh, one of the Maxwell's equations. Uh, you have an equation of state that relates how density and temperature and pressure and entropy are all related. So you have to specify what type of <coughs> fluid you're dealing with. Um, and then this is the, called the momentum equation, conservation of momentum. It's basically Newton's second law of motion that force is equal to mass times acceleration. But it's, uh, the forces are much more complicated. Uh, the acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. So this is acceleration. And here you have all the forces that are acting on every fluid parcel, every moment, in every place in, in the model. And so with, to figure out how a fluid is going to move, you have to figure out all the forces on it, and that tells you if, how the, how its velocity is going to change over the next small time step. And you figure out the pressure gradient, the minus pressure gradient, in other words, force from high pressure to low pressure. Buoyancy is what drives everything. In other words, you could have one area that's warm, and therefore the fluid has expanded a little bit. That means it's going to be a little bit less dense, and there'll be a buoyancy force. In other words, gravity will pull down on it less than it will surroundings. Or if it's heavy, it's cold and heavy, it will sink. So that has to be represented. Advection just means that uh, the fluid can move momentum from one place to another. Uh, diffusion here is, is this diffusion, so there's, there is a resistance to the flow, uh, a viscous resistance to the flow. Coriolis forces means that we're solving this equation in a rotating frame of reference. For example, you're talking about solving equations with the geodynamo, the, the, the equations are assumed to be written in terms of the reference frame of the Earth, and even though the Earth is rotating. So since the Earth is rotating, you have to account for that rotational acceleration, and that appears as a Coriolis force in the, in, in the equations. A Lorentz force means that if you have magnetic fields, where whenever you have an electric current moving perpendicular to a magnetic field, that's going to give you a Lorentz force on the fluid. Uh, so these, these are some of the forces, usually the ones that we have to figure out at every location in, in the three-dimensional computer model, at every time step, 
to figure out what the velocity at that location was going to do in the next during the next time step. Another equation is a magnetic <coughs> induction equation. This is uh, you get from Maxwell's equation. Uh, it says the rate of change of the magnetic field is equal to an, an induction term. In other words, whenever an electrically conducting fluid, like the iron, liquid iron in, in the Earth's core, or an, um, uh, the interior of, of, a, of a giant planet under very high pressure and temperature where the electrons are free, where, whenever you have an electrically conducting fluid moving through a magnetic field, moving through because it's either buoyant or being pushed by pressure or whatever, that's going to generate an electric current. And the electric current, the new electric current is going to have a new magnetic field uh, associated with it. These are all, this is all de described in great detail through the Ma Maxwell's equations and mathematics. In other words, there's a term that says you will generate magnetic field by moving, by doing work on the fluid, making it move through a magnetic field. This is the same, same idea that generates electricity. When you have, when you force wires to go through a magnetic field, it produces an electric current through the wires. Um, and then diffusion is just a magnetic diffusion. If you didn't have induction, the magnetic field would normally just diffuse away, decay away, assuming that the temperature is high enough, which is the case in all these problems. Uh, if the temperature is low on the order of uh, less than something like 500 degrees Kelvin, then you, you could have permanent magnetism. But we're talking about usually temperatures much higher than that, and, and therefore, the uh, magnetic field in that fluid would decay away that we're not continually being generated to offset the diffusion. And so that this produces it, this destroys it, and, and there's a balance, near balance all the time. And the difference will tell you how the magnetic field at every location is changing. So again, this has to be represented. There's a heat or energy equation that tells you the rate of change. Entropy is like a measure of thermal energy. Uh, you get it from joule heating or ohmic heating, in other words, electric currents going through the material, the fluid will generate heat, viscous heating, like friction, advection of heat, moving warm material from one place to another, and thermal diffusion. And finally, uh, in certain cases like the geodynamo, we also have an equation that describes how composition changes from one place to another, either by being moved around by the fluid or by diffusion. So all these equations are solved simultaneously uh, every numerical time step by the computer at every location. And, and you can have typically uh, tens of millions of different location grid points in the three-dimensional model. And so, it, so these, all these variables have to be updated at, at all those locations and typically tens of millions of time steps. And that's, what, that's, what, um, what, that's what a computer simulation is. It's, it's just a large number of time steps that show you what the variables are the flow, the three-dimensional fluid flow, the three-dimensional magnetic field, and the three thermodynamic variables. What are all these values at every location, every time step? So um, that's what goes into you know, programming a, uh, a model and, and running it on a big computer. Um, I'm not going to spend any time on this. I could, I could spend hours talking about how this is done. The numerical method is used for, for for solving the equations I just mentioned, but uh, unless you unless you do this, uh, I won't be able to enlighten you much in a few minutes anyway. So Are you doing a grid or a I, I'm using a, a what's called an Eulerian method, where you where you have a grid uh, in space, but it's partly a spectral method. In other words, I mean it's all spectral. I, I expand <coughs> variables in spherical harmonics in the horizontal direction and in Chebyshev polynomials in the, in the vertical direction. Uh, but I have to go to grid space every time step to do the nonlinear terms. So there's a, it's called a spectral transform method. Do you vary your, the size of your grid depending on where you are in the atmosphere? Do you have to make the, it smaller and the deeper in? And well, it, it, um, the, the natural grid you get for spherical harmonics is, is, is more concentrated at the poles than it is at the equator. I mean, it's just a natural thing. And the Chebyshev <coughs> grid is always more concentrated at the boundaries. That's a natural location. So I'm sort of 
forced to do it that way. Um, it's good to have a better, <coughs> more resolution in the boundaries because that's we have boundary layers to be put in, so you want better resolution there anyway. I should say, you can just interrupt me anytime you want. Um, what, what, you kind questions. Of, what kind of compute platform? Well, I use lots of computers. Any, any place I can get time. I, I'm Department of Energy computers, NASA computers, NSF computers. We have computers at, at Santa Cruz. Uh, usually I have jobs running on many different computers all over the country at the same time. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it takes, a bit. you have to, you have to apply for all this time every year and show that you're using it well. Then uh, the problem goes for uh, a long time, yeah. Yeah, and it, it, you can partition into different computers with some communication. Well, that's a good point. I, I'm using what's called parallel computers, which means that I, I can run in many processors at once, typically several hundred or a thousand processors. So I have to not only program this, I have to tell each processor what its job is and how to communicate. So every time step, every processor communicates with all the, all the others. They do some work and then they have to know what to send and receive from all the others. So that's one big supercomputer, several hundred or a thousand processors. Um, but then, even then, I, you know, I, I typically can run a job for sometimes one day, some computers at, at Ames will let, let you run it for five days. You submit a job and it will run on several hundred processors for five days continuously. But even that's a small portion of a simulation. So then I get the results and store them, and then that, that's input for the next run, the next five years. And this can go on. It's a typical simulation that I'll show you here, uh, or some of them, will take a year of my time submitting it every day, you know, for five, you know, every five days or so. So it, it's, it's, <coughs> what you do is you, you decide on what spatial resolution you want. The more grid points you have, the more confidence you have in the simulation. Uh, of course, the more grid points you have, the longer it takes. And uh, so it depends on how long you want to wait um, for your answers. Uh, this is a simulation, a, a two-dimensional simulation that one of my, my previous students did. Uh, this gravity is downwards, the bottom boundary is heated, the top boundary is cooled. It's only two-dimensional. There's no variation into and out of the board. So it's, but it's fully nonlinear. And what I want to do, with this one and the next one, I want to just point out the fact that how different a boost nest calculation is compared to one that varies, allows the background density to change. So here the background density is the same. The density at the bottom and the top are the same. Uh, you, get, you get rising plumes here and sinking plumes here, but there's a lot of symmetry, as you can see in this, this short movie. This would be like water boiling on Oh. Yeah, it's, it's basically, this heats up, and the heat can't get away fast enough by thermal diffusion, so it, it, it expands, and buoyancy causes it to rise. Up here it cools, when it cools, it gets heavy and sinks. But you get, you know, you get nice turbulent convection, but it's very symmetric. But, that, but in a giant planet, you have a variation. Here, the density down here, the background density is 148 times larger than it is up here, which is which is more realistic. What happens now is the fluid again rises, but as it rises, it expands because the density is decreasing. And likewise, up here, when it sinks, it contracts. So you get a very different velocity profile. And the point here is just that it's important to in, in, include the variation in density in models of, of stars and, and giant planets because it's a first order effect. I mean, it doesn't look at all like the previous ones. Uh, this is another previous student of mine uh, who's now uh, assistant professor at the University of Arizona in the Hampshire Science Department. What she was actually interested in is, is the sun. And I'm showing you this just to show you that uh, what she did here is said this region is convectively unstable, which is what we think the sun is doing too. The outer part is, is convecting. But the inner part is convectively stable. In other words, the radiation transfer is sufficient enough in the interior for the heat to get out. Until it gets to about here, the opacity becomes large enough that now the radiation transfer is not very efficient, and, and then convection sets in to carry the heat flux. But what you get is you get convection in this region, but you get gravity waves in the interior. So 
very short movie like this shows you the convection and generating gravity waves in the interior. What's interesting is the gravity waves are excited here and the energy actually spirals inward, but the phase propagation is outwards. It's kind of nice to actually you can show this analytically that the phase propagation is always 90 degrees uh, different than, uh, than the energy transport. But I'm showing you this that because there are certain probably certain giant planets or certain planets, extrasolar planets, that may have uh, a stable interior and, and gravity waves like, like the sun. Now I want to point out the rotational effect. Uh, here we're looking at, again, a two-dimensional simulation, but it's supposed to represent the equatorial region. So the rotation pole is coming out this way, and you're looking at it, and the basic rotation is counterclockwise. Again, we're going to watch it in the rotating frame. And what you'll see is that here, the white is, is buoyant, hot buoyant fluid. It's going to rise, but because the Coriolis force is, it's going to curve, and you'll get, you'll get fluid that tends to flow in this direction. And what happens there is that you, you have eastward momentum being transported upwards. And, and when that happens, you get a convergence of east, eastward momentum here. So this region is going to start spinning eastward, and likewise, Westward momentum is being converged here, so this region is going to start spinning backwards. This is this is to show you that a computer simulation can produce a differential rotation somewhat similar to what is seen on uh, the surfaces of of, of uh, giant planets or the sun. So it, you sort of see how this develops, where now you get very large eastward flow here and westward flow there. And it's a nonlinear effect. It's a transport of eastward momentum in a radial direction. So it's, it's Are we common. looking at the surface of a sphere here? You're, no, you're looking at the equatorial plane. Oh. The equatorial plane. Uh, so we're talking about radial differential rotation in this case. Now, uh, there's also variation in, in, in latitude. But this is all. This is only due to the variation <coughs> of density. You didn't have a background density. I don't have time to go through all the arguments, but what's basically due to the fact that the parcel rises and expands, and that causes it to, to twist in a certain direction. Uh, if you didn't have that expansion, you wouldn't have this effect. Okay, now I want to talk about a three-dimensional model. Uh, actually, a couple, one for Jupiter, one for Saturn. I start with somebody else's model. When I, you know, the word model means a lot of different things to different people, and this is a model, a one-dimensional evolutionary model that other people, uh, Tristan Dio, did. In other words, he solves for the evolution of a giant planet and tries to get it to evolve to the present state that we see, Jupiter or Saturn. And what his model is, is all strictly symmetric, only a function of radius. So he doesn't look for convection, magnetic fields, but he's doing a lot better physics than I can do in the three dimensions. And what his, his answer, his result, is a, is a profile of density, in this case temperature here. This is the center of, of, in this case, Jupiter, and this is radius in this direction out to the surface of Jupiter, showing temperature at the center being high and, and dropping off with, with, with radius. And likewise, density is high at the center and it drops off with radius, and pressure, likewise. So this would be his result. But this is where I start. I start by taking this, these profiles as my reference state, my mean reference state as a function of radius. And then I solve for the perturbations relative to that, the three-dimensional time-dependent density, pressure, temperature perturbations, and the associated velocity and magnetic fields. Uh, now, when I do this with a, with, with a very deep shell, I find that most of the action is out here uh, near the surface because um, as you go inward, the density gets so high, the, the flow velocities are not very large. So I don't have much to move the fluid around. Uh, and near the surface, where the flow velocities are the greatest, uh, the electrical conductivity is very low. But the temperature is lower, so you don't have any free electrons. So it turns out, I found that there's a, there's a region where, uh, well, what happens is as you go inwards, the electrical conductivity increases, 
We have many more free electrons. Hydrogen, this is mainly hydrogen becomes a metal. Well, here it's, it's still molecular. Here it, it loses its electrons, so it has free electrons, and so now it acts like a metal. Um, but So there's a region where you have the best of both worlds, where you have high enough electrical conductivity and large enough fluid, fluid flows to generate magnetic fields. So what I've done is, is I've made a model that just looks in this region uh, and, and does all computations in that region like that. So that, that's the radial extent of my three-dimensional model, my top boundary and my lower boundary. How, how much uncertainty is there in the equation of state for um, it, you know, metallic hydrogen? I mean, how well do we know the physics, the chemistry well, even of this? Thing? Yeah, there are experiments that have been done at Livermore. Uh, high temperature, uh, I'm going to talk about the next slide actually, okay. uh, where, where they, they um, you know, if you put hydrogen-like material under a very high pressure of temperature and they measure the, the conductivity, and, uh, and that's where a lot of this is coming from. But there's still lots of uncertainties. So what I've done here is uh, basically if, if you're above about 80% of the radius, it acts pretty much like a perfect gas. And if you get uh, deeper than that, then it's more of an electron degeneracy type material where pressure now is going something like the density to the five thirds instead of density times the temperature. So, so the equation of state is a little bit different depending on where you are. Now, as I was saying here, this is the electrical conductivity. In other words, the higher it is, the easier you get the electric currents flowing. And it's going to be an exponential, and in the, in the exponent here is, is 1 over the temperature. So the higher the temperature, also the higher the pressure, the more uh, the hydrogen atoms lose their electrons. And, uh, and as they lose their electrons, you have more free electrons, it's easier to generate electric current. In fact, hydrogen becomes a, a metal at, uh, at a roughly this pressure, which corresponds to about 84% of the radius of Jupiter. In Saturn, it's a little bit deeper than that. I think it's in 60% or something. I forget not exactly what it is. Now, this symbol, eta, is, is called a magnetic diffusivity. It's made up of 1 over this conductivity, and then mu is called the magnetic <coughs> permeability, which is, is, doesn't change very much. But it's the electrical conductivity that changes a lot. So near the surface, where the electrical conductivity is very small, the diffusivity is very large. Um, but, but at this depth, it's about this value. So above this, this depth, this data becomes very large and it becomes more diffusive, less conductive. So what I do is I, 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 I simplify this by just assuming data in my in computer simulation, it goes like an exponential. So this is the log value and radius. So it, I, it's constant in the interior and then uh, in my model, I let it increase basically exponentially, and it changes by four orders of magnitude. So I'm trying to produce a fairly realistic representation of the electrical conductivity or its magnetic diffusivity in the model. Now, some results these are snapshots, again, three dimensional, using, uh, taking account of the uh, density stratification. Uh, this is entropy, entropy perturbations, or you can think of it as temperature perturbations. Uh, the blue is, is lower. In, in this case, the, uh, the temperature perturbations are larger, uh, it's warmer in the polar regions than in the equatorial region. This is a slice through the model, the North Pole and the South Pole. This shows the, uh, the Z component of the vorticity. Basically, where you see yellow, you have fluid tending to flow this way, and blue is in, it's in the opposite direction. So it's a, it's a measure, basically I'm showing you this to show that there, there tends to be fluid flowing uh, either one way or the other, um, but with axes parallel to the rotation axis of the planet. Is the magnetic field causing uh, vortices? No, these would occur even without the magnetic field. Uh, the magnetic field will actually try to hinder this because these will tend to twist the magnetic field and there will be a, a back reaction on it. And the field does not like to be twisted. It's like rubber bands. If you try to twist it, you get a, you get a resistance there. Okay, so, um, so, so what's, what's, I mean, um, so, so the, I mean, is it, 
kind of like with the <coughs> superconductor, I mean, because it's in the conducting fluid and it's rotating, are the vortices kind of there to try to take up the angular momentum? Yeah, yeah the, the, um, the total angular momentum will add up to zero. Yeah. Uh, that means in some places it's rotating one direction, the other places it's rotating the other direction. But this this rotation rate is, is due to the fact that the whole body is rotating. It's a Coriolis force effect. Um, there's something called the Taylor problem theorem, where uh, it, 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 if you have an ideal situation with no diffusion, no viscous or thermal or viscous or magnetic diffusion, then then there should be no variation in velocity along the axis, and that's why you get these. You tend to get these vortices. So um, it's interesting that Jupiter is hotter at the poles than it is in the center. So I assume your model doesn't need to take into effect like the sunlight, the uh, potential sunlight. Yeah. And if so, uh, some of the hot Jupiter exoplanets would that be such a significant factor that it would change that? Ah, uh, that it might be. Uh, the observations of Jupiter show that the temperature in, as a function of latitude is almost constant, okay. which means, which actually agrees with this because, as you were saying, Jupiter gets more sunlight in the equatorial region. So part of the heat you're getting off, part of the temperature, part of the heat flux is due to the sun shining on it, which is heavier <coughs> here, but this just shows the heat flux coming from the interior. And, and, and that sort of compensates. So when you add the two together, you get you get a heat flux that's almost independent of latitude, and, and, and the two are, are, are have comparable amplitudes. A lot of the coming up from Jupiter is, is I forget exactly what the ratio is, but it's what you're getting from the interior of Jupiter is is not that different from what you're getting from the sun. So is it the vortices <coughs> transporting heat? To the exactly. Water? Yeah. Exactly. You, you, it's hard to transport heat in this direction, yeah. so it tends to go that way. Okay. Here, here's another snapshot, I'm not sure what <coughs> this is going to tell you. This again is the Z component, the vorticity, showing you some of the patterns in the equatorial region. Mid-latitude is very different, the pole is very different. Uh, well, this is the equatorial plane, so the, the rotation axis is in this direction now, and the planet is rotating this way, but you can sort of see uh, how, even in this three-dimensional model, it's similar to the two-dimensional movie I showed you, where where the, where the <coughs> flows tend to be tilted, and that tilt in the equatorial region is going to cause eastward momentum to be transported to the surface, and that's what's maintaining the eastward flow, the faster the equatorial uh, prograde rotation at the surface, um, at least in these models. Uh, and this is this is what I get. Um, here I'm showing you reds and yellows are representing flows, eastward flows, and the blues represent westward flow. They're all relative to the mean rotating frame reference. So I'm getting here something similar to what, this is actually similar to what you see on Saturn. If you have a very broad eastward jet, this shows you what it looks as a function of radius. And then uh, a westward jet, eastward jet, westward, eastward, etc. So we're getting bands as a function of latitude. So it's like the, the reason why you get these <coughs> kind of rotating bands in Jupiter is because the surface of the sphere is sort of cutting into what wants to be a cylindrical yeah. sy symmetry. That's what, that's, what's, that's what this appears. If this, is, if this has anything to do with Jupiter, uh, I mean, it's, it's tempting to think that it does because the surface looks very similar. Uh, there's still a question about how deep these things penetrate. Mm -hmm. um, um, but you're right, if, if, this is, if this is actually realistic, it's these, this, this is a band of westward flow and this is a band of eastward flow. And, and the reason you see the bands on the surface is that you're cutting through. This is uh, similar to what I showed you at the beginning. This is Saturn with its uh, eastward flow in the equatorial region. And this is a snapshot, well this is what the profile looks like. At, in the previous slide of the simulation is, 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 is represented here. In other words, on the same velocity scale. So in the equatorial region here, I have a very strong eastward flow and then westward, eastward, westward, eastward. Not quite as many bands <coughs> as you see on Saturn, but we're getting close to uh, some agreement there. 
What's the reason for the cutoff, Gary, with the, the, the black dots uh, in the editorial reading? Why aren't they going up as fast? Why, why these? Yeah, that's, that's it, it means it's, it, the chatter is time dependent. The, the solid line was taken by the Voyager spacecraft long ago. And apparently, and this is based on looking at the cloud features and, and just seeing how fast they move. And these are more recent observations from the space telescope. So it's just saying that this, the rotation rate in the aperture region has decreased. Uh, or, for some reason, we're, uh, we're not, not seeing, or they're not seeing the same level. Uh, maybe, maybe here, uh, uh, they were looking, you, know, you were able to see deeper for some reason than you are now, it's not clear. It's either a time dependence or a variation in how deep you're actually seeing the clouds. But I see this in the simulations too, that the, the peak isn't always like this, it, it varies with time. So it's not, it's not inconceivable that it does depend on time Saturn too. And then this is a snapshot of the magnetic field that I get from the same simulation. What I'm doing here is, is plotting magnetic field lines. The blue represents field that's directed inwards, a radial component inward, and I color it gold when it's directed outward. So the colors just mean, is it is the field directed inward or outward? And this is the basically the surface of this giant planet. And you can see in the convection zone is where you have very complicated structure, uh, very intense magnetic field. Uh, and it only looks like a nice dipole when you're outside of the planet. Uh, what's interesting here is the field is very concentrated in the polar regions and less in the equatorial region, mainly because you have all these bands, these, these alternating winds. So if the magnetic field went in this way, it would be twisted in one direction for a while and twisted in the other direction, and it doesn't like that. So it, 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 it finds a way of trying to avoid places where there's a lot of shear. And what happens here is it's able to, it's able to come in from the north, and along, remember they had these, these regions, these shells, they're all rotating at the same rate. If it, if, it, if it comes in in this direction, it, it doesn't get sure. You know, it, it, this, this one will be rotating this way, and then the other one will rotate the other way, but, but each magnetic field line doesn't, you know, avoids getting a lot of shear. It's, it's a little hard to see, because it's 3D <coughs> projected 2D, but I mean, I assume that basically nothing's penetrating below into the degenerate core of Jupiter? Well, it, it can in this case. Uh, I, I allow the magnetic field to penetrate all, all the way through the center. Yeah. I saw it through the magnetic field everywhere. But um, as, as I was saying, it's, it, there's very little motion you know, down there. It's, in fact, in my model, it only operates as a solid body. Right. And, and therefore, it tends to diffuse away. And so it's only in the region where it's continually being generated do you, you maintain a magnetic field. So, okay, so some field lines penetrate into Some field, yeah. But yeah, this doesn't show of, all of them. But most of the magnetic field is in the, it, it's, it's, it's probably near that boundary layer, right? When it's, it's going it, from being degenerate to... Exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, I don't have a plot of it right now, but you actually, when I, when I do a much deeper shell, I can see a very narrow region where the magnetic energy is the greatest. And that's, like I said, is a, is a region where it's deep enough so the electrical conductivity is high enough, but not so deep that you lose the velocity. Okay, so much for giant planet. Well, I'm going to show you one more thing. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, this is what, what I already showed you. I showed you this. This is what it looks like from a slice. But the magnetic field pattern also has a bandwidth structure in the model. Uh, this is upward uh, directed magnetic field, downward, upward. You can sort of see these bands in the 3D pattern here. So, and this is a profile of the, of the radial component of the magnetic field as a function of, of latitude, the equator, north pole, south pole. So this basically shows you this pattern. So you know, maybe when we get a, an orbiter around you know, close enough to Jupiter to measure the magnetic field very carefully, we might be able to see bands in the magnetic field too. So if you're in the upper atmosphere, a compass doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You have to know where you are. Okay, now I'm going to switch to, um, boy, I don't have much time. 
I'm going to switch to very quickly uh, terrestrial panel like the Earth. And uh, just to get everybody in the right page, this is the mantle where I'm going to assume that it's uh, insulator because the core, liquid core, is mainly iron and it has much higher electrical conductivity. This region is, is a fluid core and then there's a solid iron core. And this solid core is slowly growing as the earth cools off. Um, this is a snapshot of the magnetic field I get from that simulation. You can see it's, uh, it's much more dipolar. Uh, it, 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 it's, um, it doesn't have the problem with, of, of the equatorial region because we don't, I don't get the simulation. I don't get banded structure in, in this model for the Earth. Uh, you can sort of see what's called the tangent cylinder. The magnetic field tends to know that there's a solid inner core here. So there's, there, there's a velocity shear through the fluid that reflects the structure of the magnetic field. Um, okay, so here's, here's, a, here's a small simulation I, I did many years ago now uh, showing you a time in terms of thousands of years, so 300,000 years. Uh, what I'm plotting here is the pole, actually the south magnetic pole, this is the North Geographic Pole, the Equator, and the South Geographic Pole. So this, when the curve's up here, it means that the South Magnetic Pole is, is, is near our North Geographic Pole. Then there was a reversal, and it stayed in the reverse pattern for a, a long, uh, you know, several hundred thousand years, and then it reversed back again. This shows you what the dipole moment, in other words, the intensity of the magnetic field looks like as a function of time, and typically, Whenever there is a reversal, the field strength gets very small, and then it comes back again and goes up and down a lot, and it gets very small and back again. But it doesn't last very. That that period doesn't seem to last very long. This period, or the, the, the period of reversal, when it's acting, when the dipole di di moment drops. The, that's right. Now, what I, this period is typically on the order of five thousand years. Oh, that's kilojoules. Okay. This is thousands of years. Yeah. Oh, okay. And actually, the number of grid, number of time steps. Remember, I talked about computer model solving all these equations. It solves them, updates everything, that's one time step. From here to here is about 30,000 time steps. So it looks like it did it instantaneously, but it took 30,000 solutions to the equations to actually see this, this reversal. Um, so now what I want to do is, is show you what it looks like in the movie. I'm going to I'm going to show you one of the simulations, one of the reversals, and I'm going to show you just about 7,000 years around that reversal. Typically, it, this goes for hundreds of thousands of years, and just it's time dependent, but it doesn't reverse. This is going to show you what the reversal looks like, and what I'm going to show you is what the field looks like at the, at the surface. <coughs> what would be the surface of the Earth? Again, red represents outward directed magnetic field, and blue represents inward directed. So this is looking at just the radial component. And this is what it looks like at the top of the core, at the bottom of the mantle. Okay. It's more complicated because um, it's closer to the source. The source of all this is below, below the, um, the core mantle boundary. So I'm going to show you this. This will just take a, a minute. But it's, it's time dependent. Tends to be a sort of a westward drift, similar to what's observed at certain places on the Earth, and that's that's the reversal now. It's, for some reason, we just now have magnetic field upward in the northern hemisphere and in, inward in the southern hemisphere. So, like I said, this this is sort of a special time during the full simulation. It goes for months and months and months and doesn't do anything, and all of a sudden, it does something like that you know, on its own. I'm going to show you now the same reversal, but in a different pattern. What you, what you saw was what the field looks like at the surface of the Earth and also at the top of the core. But now I'm going to show you what it looks like inside. But it's, and this, these plots are now averaged in longitude. So it's really a three-dimensional flow, a three-dimensional field, but you're going to see it averaged in longitude. And this side tells you the magnetic field lines. It's blue when, it, when it's clockwise directed. Remember, it was initially inwards in the northern hemisphere, outwards in the southern hemisphere. This side shows you the toroidal part of the magnetic field. This means it's eastward directed. This means it's westward directed. These are contours. These are not field lines. So it says if there's a strong toroidal field going around this way, and a strong toroidal field going around the opposite in the northern hemisphere. 
And the inner core is solid, but magnetic field can penetrate, can diffuse in there. So I'll show you what that reversal looks like in this region. It starts, come on. There we go. So it's still time dependent, even though I've averaged now in longitude. But every once in a while there's a there's a, a disturbance, like a storm in the fluid, that causes the field lines to be twisted in the opposite direction. And in a moment here, you'll see one of those cases where you get uh, an instability in this region, there and there. Now, yellow means it's directed in the other, other direction. And then it almost dies away. And for some reason, the flow continues to destroy the original clarity. And in this case, actually maintains a new clarity. So now if you're sitting out here on the Earth, you think the reversal is complete, but the original clarity is still anchored in the, in the inner core. It takes a couple thousand years for this to diffuse away. And, and so eventually it diffuses away and a new, new magnetic field diffuses in. And then the toroidal field also reverses direction. So this is just one example. We've had several reversals occur uh, over the last, well, this, this one actually I, I simulated you know, nearly, nearly 15 years ago. And I've shown it probably several hundred times since then. But every reversal we've seen so far is a little different. They last a little different amount of time. They, they may start a different place. A lot of them start in, near the inner core. Um, and I suspect that the Earth does the same thing. It, it has lots of reversals, uh, but um, but each one's a little different. So what is the time scale to lose information of the prior state? And what time scale? It's, well, the, 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 the magnetic diffusion time in the inner core is about 2,000 years. And so, in other words, what, has, what typically happens is what's called an abortive reversal, where it, and this is seen on the Earth, too, where you, you see lo, the certain locations where it looks like it reversed, but within 10,000 years, it's back to the original polarity. It's done this many times since our last reversal, which was 780,000 years ago. In other words, since then, in fact, as, as, as soon as, uh, as early as uh, 35,000 years ago, there was an event where it looked like it was reversed, but it didn't last very long. So what happens here is, is, is whenever it tries to reverse, the original polarity has an advantage because it has, you know, enough time, has more time for it to diffuse out of the inner core. And so in other words, whatever is causing the reversal, whatever flow structures are trying to twist it, it's got to keep going for on the order of several thousand years uh, in order to completely reverse and de-reversed for a long time. I'm going to ask if an ice sheet on, on the surface makes any, any difference, like on the Earth's ice ages, but I think you're getting to that now. With the yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time. I, I, let me just say a little bit about the third subject. This is, uh, this, these are simulations we're doing, or my, my um, graduate student's doing, using a, a different version of my model, but to try to simulate the ocean circulation, three-dimensional circulation below the ice crust of Europa. And then, assuming that it has a, a, enough electrical conductivity to be able to try to cancel out Jupiter's time-dependent field. In other words, Europa's going around Jupiter. Jupiter has a field that is a dipole, and its, its uh, rotation rate is about 10 hours, but it's tilted. So Europa sees Jupiter's field going back and forth every 10 hours. So that's a time-dependent field. And a time-dependent field will generate an electric current, which will try to produce a magnetic field to cancel out that time dependence. So that's what's happening, that's been observed or measured to be happening um, on Europa, and that's one of the reasons, one of the arguments for a subsurface ocean is that the magnetic field around Europa is, is, uh, is different than it is, or Jupiter's background field is different, it's been changed by, by, um, by the circulation in the ocean. So we're trying to simulate this, and um, let me very quickly say, I won't go through a lot of details. We prescribe a tidal. Well, now what we're doing is we're saying, instead of convection, well, we can add convection, but mainly it's driven by tidal potential. So I, I prescribe a tidal potential uh, in terms of spherical harmonics. It includes the, X, the, um, 
the uh, um, the eccentricity or the, the uh, yeah the eccentricity of the orbit, and this would include the obliquity of the orbit. In other words, uh, the the, the um, the gravitational field that the Europa feels is going to be time dependent depending on its, uh, its orbital dynamics. And so I, I impose this in the equation, the momentum equation, and then allow the, the surface basically to, to, to follow Jupiter. So the guiding center is sort of the average location where, where Jupiter is, but Jupiter looks more like an ellipse in the sky if you're sitting on Europa. And so there's a bulge that tends to always point towards Jupiter. And this is all captured in the model. I'm, I'm running way over here, so I'm going to go very quickly. But in the, as you get, you can take snapshots of what the, the, the bulge looks like as a function of time on the surface. And uh, you can also impose a heat flux at the, at the base due to, due to only key or due to um, tidal heating. And this is the induced magnetic field that is trying to cancel out the time-dependent magnetic field from Jupiter. I'm, I'm going very quickly here, but let me just summarize that, that in all these cases, the giant planets or terrestrial planets or satellites, uh, and we're, we're making progress slowly. Uh, we're, we have still a long ways to go, a lot of uncertainties. Uh, we need to add more and better physics. Uh, we need to use higher spatial resolution, in other words, more grid points more spherical harmonics to get more confidence and, and be able to lower the viscosity. In, in all these simulations, the viscosity we have is much higher than it should be because of, because of uh, the numerical constraints. So if we have more spatial resolution, we could lower the viscosity to something more realistic and therefore get more stronger turbulence, which it should be. Uh, we need better numerical methods and parallelization, faster computers. Uh, so there's a lot more to be done. Um, Jared, if we could just maybe get a couple of questions in. Uh, sure. And I'll start with one. So the, the uh, magnetic reversals that happen here on Earth, uh, we expect them to happen on the giant planets. And, and have you seen them in the simulations? I haven't seen them in the giant planets. Um, and of course, there's no record of it you know, on Earth. We know about it because there is a magnetic record in rocks, uh, in the ocean bottom, in lava flows. You can date the lava flow and figure out when the lava cooled below 500 degrees, the period temperature. That's when it captured the magnetic field at that location at that time. So you have you can actually see reversals of lava flows at a slip line, but you can't you, know, you don't have that for giant planets. So we, we don't know. You know there is the suggestion that maybe. Uh, maybe Uranus and Neptune, where their magnetic field is tilted so much, maybe it's in the process of undergoing a uh, reversal at this point very slowly. But I, I, I have no reason to think that reversals don't happen in the giant planets. Um, but uh, we, haven't, we haven't run our simulation long enough to see one. Um, and uh, but that, that would be nice to be able to predict sort of predict what the time between reversals. On the sun, the sun reverses every 11 years or so. Yeah. You know, it's very periodic. It's, it's a, you know, it uses the same equations, the same physics, but it's a different parameter regime. Uh, on the Earth, the time between reversals is, is typically several hundred thousand years. Uh, and then the reversal takes about a few thousand years for, for it to occur. Um, but it's very random on the Earth. So the mechanism, the, the dynamo mechanism in the Earth is quite different than it is in the sun. And it's probably, again, different than giant planets. But there, I, there's no reason to think that they don't reverse. I just don't know how often. How many cells, parcels, do you typically use on some of these? Well, let's see. Uh, typically something like uh, 200 levels in radius times, uh, times you know, about 500 in latitude times about a thousand in longitude, so whatever the product of those three numbers is, it's a large number, yeah. And then, so you, like I said, every numerical time step, and a time step in the simulation for Jupiter is something on the order of, of um, a few minutes. So you know, you're, you're, only, you're only advancing the solution a few minutes in time, 
but you had to solve, you had to update everything on you know, millions of grid points uh, during that few minutes. And then with that information, you, you can go solve the equations again and go another few minutes at the time. So the computer does this very fast and very accurately, uh, but still it takes, like I said, a simulation takes uh, a wall clock time, you know, it takes close to a year of running on many processors. You can do it less if you want to run it, simulate it less time, or if you want to simulate it at lower resolution, more coarse resolution, obviously you can do it much less time. And that's how you test the models. But when you, when you really want to discover something or understand something, you need to, you need to have high resolution. And we still don't have as high as, you know, as, 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 as high resolution as we'd like to have. What we might do is, if there's any further questions, you're welcome to come up and speak to our speaker after the talk. And Gary, we have a special mentor. Oh, thank you. In uh, commemoration of your talk. If you'll join me in thanking Gary.